Well, welcome to this uh, uh, very new law school with its highly uh, technical <laughs> AV system that's uh, failing us this afternoon. Um, uh, I'm Charlie Pillsbury. I'm co-director of the uh, Center on Dispute Resolution here. And um, the center uh, co-sponsors a, a series of uh, uh, lectures, workshops uh, um, on dispute resolution with the Yale Law School. And uh, my colleague, uh, Noah Messing, who's a co-collaborator, is uh, on sabbatical in Australia. So we can't feel sorry for, for Noah. There's apparently no snow there. So uh, he's doing fine. Um, uh, and uh, uh, we have a, uh, uh, a wonderful speaker today. And actually, uh, it's a talk that, uh, a, that really fits into Dean Brown's original conception, which is this is as a workshop. Uh, because the, the paper you're going to be uh, learning about is still in progress. Uh, uh, there are drafts, but it's not yet published, and so uh, this is an opportunity for you as a, a very intelligent and engaged audience that I know you are to uh, help our, our author sharpen his arguments and uh, uh, keep him on his toes. So uh, uh, I'm looking forward to the day. So let me introduce uh, uh, our guest. Uh, Professor Thaddeus uh, Mason Pope is the director of the Health Law Institute and an associate professor of law at Hamlin University. He's also an adjunct professor with the Australian Center for Health Law Research at Queensland University of Technology, and an adjunct associate professor with the Alden March Bioethics Institute at Albany Medical College. Uh, he also recently uh, uh, emailed me from the West Indies, where he was teaching medical jurisprudence to uh, to a, a medical college of St. George in Grenada. So this, this man is a, a world traveler. Uh, um, he has more than 100 publications in leading medical journals, law reviews, bar journals, nursing journals, bioethics journals, and book chapters. He's also co-authored the treatise of the right to die, the law of end of life decision making, and runs the popular, now more popular that you've heard of, medical futility blog. So, uh, Check that out, Medical Futility Blog. Uh, with that, uh, I'll turn it over to Professor Pope. Um, so I, what I want to do is, and I'll, if I hopefully I can do this, is go a little bit outside the paper um, to kind of go where, where I'm going to go next. Um, if I wanted to be more provocative, I think, I think the title of the the pay, for those of you who have the paper, it is, it is a draft, so it's not completely polished, um, is about whether te the Texas Advanced Directives Act is a model dispute resolution for intractable medical futility disputes. Um, although, I, if I wanted to be more, more provocative, I suppose I would have titled it, um, Must a Death Panel Be a Star Chamber? Um, because these sort of really, if there's anything that's appropriately named a death panel, it, it's probably what we're going to talk about now. So back, back in the uh, early beginnings of bioethics in the mid-70s, there is this, there is one, an, one of the questions that state Supreme Courts were struggling with was whether or not we should delegate the resolution of treatment disputes to a tribunal other than a court. And at that time, there was a split among the state Supreme Court. So just as an example, famously, the, the Quinlan case in New Jersey said yes, uh, ethics hospital ethics committees can sort of substitute for courts in some of these instances. But the Massachusetts Supreme Judicial Court in the Sykowitz case said uh, no. And, and what they said um, was, uh, we, you know, we don't think this should be delegated to anybody other than a court, these life and death treatment decisions. Well, that's actually now been settled. So the question about whether we should delegate, whether we should delegate the resolution of treatment disputes to a tribunal other than a court has sort of been answered. Um, the question now is, what do we want that alternative tribunal to look like? Um, what's, what's the form? We know what the function is that we want it to serve, but what's the form that we want it to have? All right, so what I want to do uh, in terms of a roadmap is 
provide some uh, context and background. So what is a medical futility dispute? How common are they? And to talk about how they're typically resolved. And then that will bring us to the, to the core target, um, which is the subset of those disputes that remain intractable to what usually works, which is intensive communication, negotiation, and mediation. All right, so what's, what's a medical futility dispute? <laughs> I have great visuals. Um, a, a medical futility dispute is, is normally framed as a problem of surrogate-driven over-treatment, meaning that the clinician thinks that the appropriate course of action um, is comfort measures only, but the surrogate um, think, still wants to continue with aggressive, life-sustaining medical treatment. And so there's three key attributes to a medical futility dispute. One is it's normally concerning patients that are in the ICU, um, and so the life-sustaining treatment, and, and it concerns life-sustaining medical treatment, such as dialysis, a mechanical ventilator, clinically assisted nutrition and hydration, and interventions like that. Okay, so that's one. The second key attribute is that these patients who we're talking about in the ICU almost never have decision-making capacity. So the treatment decision that is the subject of the dispute is being made by the patient's surrogate decision maker. And then third, the nature of the dispute is that the, the clinicians think it's time to uh, stop aggressive measures and move to comfort measures only, and the surrogate wants to continue. So it's sort of the clinicians say stop, the surrogates say go. And one other key uh, piece of background is that these, these when we, while we, these, the, the term is medical futility disputes, nobody thinks that's a good term, but it's stuck and so we use it. Um, th these are not strictly futile treatments. They might keep the patient alive. So the dispute is not a medical dispute and it's not a scientific dispute. It's a value-laden dispute. One very common type of situation is you have a patient who's permanently unconscious in a persistent vegetative state, and the question is, should we continue to give dialysis to this patient? Dialysis will work. It will achieve everything that dialysis is supposed to achieve. The question is whether or not, since the person is never going to recover and they're never even aware of their own existence, unable to communicate and interact with the human community, is that dialysis worthwhile? Okay, so it's, it's a value-laden dispute. They're very common. Um, recently in the, in the uh, Journal of Critical Care Medicine, described as being in, quote, epidemic proportions. Memorial Sloan Kettering reports 13% of their annual ethics consults are medical futility disputes. The University of Michigan system, 33% of their annual ethics consults. And Stanford, more than half of their annual ethics consults are medical futility disputes. UCLA had a recent pretty high profile study in JAMA internal medicine where they surveyed their own critical care clinicians in five of the UCLA ICUs, self-reported that 20% of all the treatment provided during the study period was futile or probably futile. And these, all these rates are likely to rise because, well, among other reasons, people, surrogates are more likely to resist clinician recommendations for comfort measures only. Just one report, the Pew, the Pew Charitable Trust uh, for 25 years has been measuring American views on end-of-life treatment. And they asked this question in 1990, do you think that um, clinicians should do, quote, everything possible to save the life of the patient in all circumstances? In 1990, 15% of the American public agreed with that. In 2013, 31% of the public, right? So, in that, so it's just rising, and that's replicated in other surveys by other, other organizations. And of course, with the growth in the elderly population, the, the volume of patients who are going to be in US ICUs and going to have these views is obviously itself rising as well. So we, we have these disputes. The good news is, fortunately, they're almost always resolved intramurally and informally. It's only a small subset that remain intractable. So with negotiation, mediation, and intensive communication, clinicians and surrogates can reach consensus and agreement 95% of the time. 
There's a number of studies um, that show uh, that show this. Right? There's one that's recent from Kaiser Southern California. They basically had a hundred disputes. They had a family meeting that went down. There's only 70 disputes that still remain intractable. Second family meeting, only 12. Third family meeting, eventually only five disputes were intractable to continued discussion. Same thing, and that's been the same thing in study after study all the way back since 1998, is eventually clinicians and the surrogates can reach agreement 95% of the time. So it's only 5% of medical futility disputes that remain intractable. Even for that subset, it's already small, some of those patients can be transferred. So maybe there's another facility that's willing to provide the treatment that the current facility is unwilling to provide. So anyway, what I want to frame is we're all the way, if you had a funnel, right? Most of these cases are resolved way up here, and it's only this tiny subset of less than 5% of the cases that can't be resolved through some other dispute resolution mechanism. In those cases, well, what happens typically in those cases? Normally, clinicians cave in, okay? They think that continued aggressive life-sustaining measures for patients who are permanently unconscious or who are imminently dying is medically and ethically inappropriate, but they provide it anyway. They follow the substitute decision maker instead of what they think, instead of doing what they think is right. Um, and this is, again, this is surveyed to death, no pun intended, but you know, they, they, even the Medscape survey, which is a pretty big survey from just a few months ago, two thirds of physicians said, yes, I would provide treatment that I know is futile. Now, in a few states, that's actually legally mandated. The state says you must always follow the surrogate all of the time, no matter how stupid you think their decision is, um, even if you think it's contrary to the standard of care, even if you think it's contrary to good medical practice. But that's only a few states. Even in all the other states, clinicians still cave in and follow surrogate decisions to do medicine that they think is inappropriate. Why, why do they do that? One reason is legal fear. Right, this is, just, uh, this is just one, so I don't think the computer is talking to the, so one reason is legal uh, fear, right? This is just one other species of defensive medicine, right? Most of the CAT scans we provide, not medically indicated, they're legally indicated, right? So this is just another species of defensive medicine. And plus it's easy to cave in, right? The critical care clinician is gonna round off, it's not gonna be their problem after next Wednesday. Um, it's really the nurses are going to bear the brunt of it. So the decision maker really doesn't bear the costs of their own decision. So that's the status quo. That said, though, critical care clinicians are not really happy with the status quo. It creates a number of bad results, right? The nurses feel like they're torturing the patient. Um, there's these great quotes. This is the Massachusetts General Hospital, not Auschwitz, uh, in, in court papers. Um, there's not much difference, quote, not much difference between what we're doing here and the, and the atrocities in the Bosnian War. It's the single biggest source of moral distress in the nursing profession, and it's poor stewardship for a lot of reasons, but one is um, there's patients who are denied access to the ICU, either from that, the very same hospital's emergency department or from a referring community hospital who have the opportunity to benefit from being in the ICU, who are denied that opportunity because there's somebody who's never gonna recover um, using up those beds. In this month's uh, Critical Care Medicine uh, Journal, there's a survey of 700 critical care clinicians, uh, and they asked, do you, do you see this a lot? Overwhelmingly, 80% said, yes, I see this a lot. We're providing futile care. And do you think it's a big problem? Again, overwhelmingly agreed. So they're not happy with the status quo. In the same survey, they said, well, how do you, how do you think we can deal with this, right? The fact that uh, surrogates are asking you to provide end of life medicine that you think is too aggressive and, and overly aggressive. How can we deal with that? One of the solutions that was proposed that was agreed to by a majority of the responding uh, surveyors, survey takers is, um, 
a committee that can issue binding decisions. Okay, so at least they think what they want, and this is what I wanted just to provide this context, they want adjudicators, right? They want an adjudicating tribunal here. Now the paradigm dispute resolution mechanism is a court, um, but at least for these cases and similar treatment level decisions, nobody thinks that that's an appropriate tribunal. It's cumbersome, it's time consuming, and it's expensive. So what people really want is a custom designed dispute resolution mechanism. It's faster, cheaper, and better than a court. And the model here is, th is that everybody is looking to and holding out and trying to follow and trying to copy is the Texas Advanced Directives Act. A lot of other states have already tried to copy it and follow it. Um, there's been medical association resolutions in California, in Wisconsin, in Washington. The Idaho Senate passed a bill modeled completely off the Texas Advanced Directives Act. Uh, New Jersey tried to follow it, the, the Greater New York Hospital Association, New Jersey Medical Society, and New Jersey Hospital Association asked for a Texas-type rule. Um, so in general, people are really trying to, in, at least endorsing and recommending, that we follow Texas. So what's the Texas Advanced Directives Act? So it, 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 now it's a, pretty, it's a comprehensive piece of legislation. So it deals with everything from advanced directives to surrogates to DNR orders, out of hospital DNR orders. So I'm only folk, I'm going to refer to it as the Texas Advanced Directives Act, but we're really just talking about a couple of the sections that focus on dispute resolution. It was signed into law back in 1999 by Governor Bush. And in a nutshell, what it does is it tells a clinician, a physician, you may stop life-sustaining medical treatment for any reason, if you deem it to be inappropriate, with civil, disciplinary, and criminal immunity, so long as your own hospital ethics committee agrees with you. That's basically what it says. Now that breaks down into six steps. Um, the first step would be the clinician has recommended what she thinks is the only appropriate course of action here, which is comfort measures only. The family disagrees. Hopefully, the physician actually tries to mediate that, but there's no obligation in the statute to try mediation first, and so some people jump straight to invoking the formal process. That's step one, is you invoke the review committee. It's called a review, it's, that's the quote, review committee. Because it doesn't have to be the ethics committee. Some hospitals have what's uh, it's called a MARC, M-A-R-C, Medical Appropriateness Review Committee, which is a separate ad hoc committee just for this specific purpose. Okay, so step one is invoke the review committee, say I have a case I want to bring to you. Step two, provide notice to the surrogate. So the statute does require that, the sur that there's certain uh, written information that's specified in the statute that tells the surrogate about their rights in this process. You have to give them at least 48 hours notice that's the, um, of the fact that the committee is going to convene to hear this case. Side note, that's often given on a Friday actually and then the, the, the review committee meets on Monday. So, okay, so yeah, so, the sec so that you give the uh, surrogate notice. Um, third step is you hold the meeting. Uh, the review committee convenes, hears from the attending about why they think the, the, this life-saving medical treatment is inappropriate. No right actually in the statute about what the, the surrogate can attend, not quite clear exactly what the surrogate's rights to participate in the meeting are. Step four. Review committee makes a decision. Overwhelmingly, review committees agree with the physician that, took, that brought the case to them. Then um, they're supposed to reduce their uh, decision to what's called a written explanation and serve that you know, the writ, the, in writing to the surrogate, say that we decided gram, your grandmother, your wife, we're, we're gonna, uh, life support is inappropriate. We know that's what you want, but we think it's inappropriate that served on the surrogate. At that point, once they're served with the, with the review committee's decision, the surrogate has 10 days to try to find another facility that's willing to provide the treatment that this facility's review committee just determined was inappropriate. If, they, if they're still there and they, haven't, and they usually can't find these transfers, um, on the 11th day, the current facility may stop 
life support um, over the objections of the surrogate and without consent, and they have civil, disciplinary, and criminal immunity for doing so. It works. I mean, from, from the critical care clinician's perspective, it works. It's been used quite a bit over the last 16 years. Um, but what I want to just flag are the question is whether it's sufficiently fair. Um, in the debate over medical futility, which is maybe 25 years old, for the first 15 years of that, there's a big debate about how to define medical futility, right? And people have tried to come up with definitions. You know, is it, if something is only 1% likely to work, then it's medically futile. So we came up with these quantitative definitions, qualitative definitions, all the, that's all been sort of disregarded, and generally people think we can't define medical futility. So what we moved to was a pure procedural approach, um, which is what, te which, what, what Texas has done here, which is there's no standards in the statute to, to define when something is or is not medically appropriate. They just specify the process. Now, when you have a no substantive standards and all you have is pure process, the process really needs to have integrity and fairness because the only thing that justifies the outcome, which is the you know, unconsented withdrawal of life support, is the fact that it went through these six steps. So you really kind of need the six steps to have some fairness to them because that's the only thing that justifies the outcome. I think that the Texas Advanced Directives Act is subject to four key risks. One is risk of corruption, meaning that this decision is going to be made in the self-interest of the facility. Second, the risk of carelessness, that it's going to be an ill-considered and ill-supported outcome. The risk of bias, whether racial or ethnic or socioeconomic. And the risk of arbitrariness. But I, what, I, what I'm trying to do, and I know this is, probably needs to be beefed up in this article, is, is to frame this in terms of procedural due process, right? Whenever there's a deprivation of life, liberty, or property, due process rights are triggered, right? And normally that means notice, the opportunity to present, the opportunity to confront, a statement of decision, an independent and neutral decision maker, and judicial review. Now, these are, of course, constitutional. They're triggered you know, by the Fifth or Fourteenth Amendments. But the same notions, because I'm not doing a con law thing here, the same, all the same notions are also elements of just fundamental fairness, you know, even outside of a strict constitutional law analysis. So let me just pick a couple of them. Am I doing okay on? Yeah. Okay. So um, one is the neutral decision maker, right? Maybe what's often held out to be the most important aspect of procedural due process, right? Who makes the decision here? It's the intramural institutional ethics committee controlled by the hospital. Now, the Texas Advanced Directives Act at least makes a gesture to saying, oh, we, we need to have some independence. They don't let the attending make it, the decision all by herself. It does need to go to a review committee. This is an element of you know, some externalness, but it's not that external. They do require that the attending can't serve on the committee if they happen to you know, already have been a member. But everybody is an insider. Um, there's no com for IRBs, for example, we have a community member requirement. There's no community member requirement here. And in fact, uh, a recent, relatively recent survey shows that less than 10% of Texas hospital ethics committees have a community member on, meaning a member who's not affiliated with the, with the facility. Now, maybe this wasn't so odd back in 1999, but since then, we've focused a lot on conflicts of interest in healthcare, um, whether, whether through pharma issues or otherwise. Um, and in fact, a number of futility cases have been motivated by economic concerns, meaning the, the exhaustion of health care uh, insurance coverage. So we don't have a neutral and independent decision maker. The statement of decision, right? The reason we want a statement of decision um, is because by, force, by having to write it out and explain why you think this is the right result, it forces you to provide a rationale, a basis, and to sort of make sure it's well considered. Um, now, some Texas hospitals provide nice explanations and explain why they think um, life support is inappropriate. But again, there's nothing in the statute that provides any minimum floor of content or format 
to these written explanations. And if I would show you this one big hospital in Houston, Memorial Hermann, that uses a pre-printed uh, form. And, it's, and there's basically no explanation, right? They, it's just, you know, life support, bad. You know, and it's, uh, it, it, so there's, it, it's not, that does two things. It means that it's not clear that how carefully they thought this through, what the analysis is, what the rationale was, what the reasons are. And the surrogate doesn't really get that either. So it seems unjust to them because they're not, nobody's explained carefully why this is the right thing to do. And then, and then, then it goes on. I mean, I, I guess I'll truncate this part, but there's no other rules of procedure on voting, on quorum, or anything else about how these, you know, they're making life and death decisions, but there's no rules of procedure. And then finally, whatever due process problems you normally have, the one cure, generally, is the fact that you would have judicial review. Um, so whatever crap happens, you know, with your, that, that, your medical staff committee or the DMV or whatever agency is doing whatever they're doing, you always have judicial review to clean it up on the back end. Texas Advanced Directives Act denies judicial review. Um, so the, the, whatever the Ethics Committee has done, you cannot take that to court and challenge what, what the Ethics Committee has done. They are the forum of last resort. So what I want to do, and this goes a little bit outside the paper, is contrast that with another dispute resolution mechanism for medical futility disputes. And that, that's the Ontario Consent and Capacity Board, which isn't quite as famous as the Texas Advanced Directives Act for this purpose, but it really got a recent bump because there was a case that went to the Supreme Court of Canada. The Supreme Court of Canada endorsed this as a great solution for these types of uh, conflicts. Basically, um, what, the text, what the Ontario Consent and Capacity Board does is it's doing what I, what I call surrogate selection. When you have a healthcare surrogate, their job is to step into the shoes of the patient and make the decision that the patient would have made for herself. They're supposed to exercise sub, what's called substituted judgment. If we don't have enough information about what the patient's wishes, preferences, and values were, then the surrogate is supposed to make the decision according to a best interest standard, just objective evaluation of what would be in the best interest of the patient. Surrogates suck at this. Every study out there shows the accuracy rate is at about 60% in terms of a surrogate making the same decision that the patient would have made for herself. And overwhelmingly, that error rate all leans in one direction, meaning surrogates make more aggressive treatment decisions than the patient would have made for herself. The patient would have declined these measures. Surrogate is asking for them. Now, absolutely, surrogates, they're having, it's, a, it's a new job they're performing, and, it's, and they're having to perform this job under tough circumstances. A loved one is dying. But if they persist in not following the governing decision making standards, they can and should be replaced. That's what the Consent and Capacity Board does. So if the advanced patient, let's say the patient has an advanced directive, the advanced directive says stop and the surrogate says go, it's a bad surrogate, right? They really bound by the patient's advanced directive. If the patient's known wishes say stop, but the surrogate says go, bad surrogate. You're not following you're not making a decision consistent with the patient's known wishes and preferences. Or, if the patient's best interest dictates stop, but the surrogate says go, again, bad surrogate. That's the, that's the function of the Consent and Capacity Board, is to replace surrogates when they're deviating and making decisions inconsistent with the governing decision-making standards. It's efficient and responsive, just like the Texas Advanced Directives Act, right? 48 hours, you can hold that ethics committee meeting, make the decision, and that starts the 10-day clock. Here, uh, also efficient and responsive. The process begins, the, the clinician would file what's called a Form G, uh, which is a petition that says uh, the substitute decision maker is not complying uh, with the, with the decision-making standards. The CCB has to hold a hearing within seven days, and they have to issue the decision within one day of the hearing. Unlike the Texas Advanced Directives Act, this is a neutral and independent tribunal. 
There's three members on a board. None of them are affiliated with the referring facility. Um, now, the CCB does a lot of other things other than medical futility cases. It's, it's, it does all mental uh, commitments and all other sorts of stuff related to the Mental Health Act and a substitute, ah, <laughs> uh, and a substitute decision makers act. Um, they're trained, so they, they train these, uh, thanks, they train uh, these members. In, again, in, in Texas, it's unclear who's on, the eth who's on these ethics committees, what their qualifications are, uh, and so forth. There are rules of practice. This is actually rather detailed. This is 14 single page pages for rules of practice, right? Again, all these rules that, not, that the T Texas Vent Directors Act is completely silent on. There's decisions, they're all published. You can get them on the Canada uh, Cases website. They're good decisions. Again, provide a rationale, explanation for why they think the surrogate has deviated from the applicable standards. And the Consent and Capacity Board decisions are subject to judicial review. Um, you can take those to the Ontario courts. Now, there's just one limit in Ontario, um, and that's that you may have a surrogate that is a good surrogate. They're a loyal and faithful surrogate meaning they're making the same decision that the patient would have made for themselves. Big example would be religion. In the, this, is, this is the case that went to the Supreme Court. Hassan Rasuli, um, Pete in a persistent vegetative state, in the hospital for four years in this hospital. Um, clinicians want, thought the appropriate course of action was to uh, disconnect the life support. His family would not consent to that. Why? Because that would be inconsistent with his Muslim beliefs. They are good surrogates. They're making the same decision that he would have made for himself, so there's no basis to replace them. So this is, this is a limitation of the Consent and Capacity Board. It can only replace bad surrogates. Um, or another way to say it is, in Texas, you can determine that a good surrogate has made a bad decision, but in, in Ontario, you can only assess the decision maker and not the decision itself. So, the Texas Vents Directives Act has a slightly broader scope of adjudicatory authority than the Consent and Capacity Board, uh, but it, I think that the Consent and Capacity Board can achieve most of the same benefits as the Texas Vents Directives Act, but without the affront to fundamental principles of due process and fairness. So, we, I, this is sort of where I end up. We, we have basically two fundamental objectives for these dispute resolution mechanisms. We want to be, them to be efficient, meaning responsive, act quickly, but we want them to be fair. And unfortunately, those two objectives are in some tension or conflict, and not totally incommensurable, but they're in conflict. I think the Texas Events Directors Act is efficient, it's responsive, mm. um, but unfortunately not fair enough. In contrast, Consent and Capacity Board, not quite as efficient, but way more fair. Um, and so as, as, and there are a lot of other states and, and even some other countries um, looking to, to, the, to these two models to figure out what type of dispute resolution mechanism they want to enact and implement for these types of treatment disputes. Um, and I guess what I'm going to recommend is that the Consent and Capacity Board is a better model to follow than the Texas Advanced Directors Act. All right, so I'll stop, and so now I want to hear what you guys. Oh. Yes. Yeah. Oh. Has the constitutionality of the Texas Act been challenged either in state or federal court? It, the cases have been filed, but they have not been adjudicated. Because what happens in these cases, as, it, as in a lot of end-of-life cases, is the patient dies during the course of litigation, and then, then the case gets voluntarily dismissed. So no court has uh, ruled on constitutionality. And, and just as a side note, of course, you're going to need a state actor. Um, now, a good Texas, one, a good one third of the, I think it's 400, three to 400 Texas hospitals are uh, government hospitals. So you, you, can, you can get the challenge. It just hasn't happened. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you, you, when you use the term surrogate, you're talking about someone who has been appointed, we would call in Connecticut, a health care agent or just... Oh, yeah, so good question. I, well, I use the word surrogate as a, as a catch-all. So it doesn't, you can get your authority in four ways, right? Um, and so I'm using it, it doesn't matter if you, got, if you got it from the court, 
if you got it from an advanced directive, from a durable power of attorney healthcare, or what's sometimes called a default surrogate, just by your next of kin status. So I, I'm using it, I'm agnostic to where, where, where you got the authority to be the substitute decision maker from. You're right, from state to state, some people say proxy, surrogate, the terms are inconsistent. I should have said that, I use it as a catch-all. Okay, and the other question is, where the person has, has signed an advanced directive, I don't know what happened in the Canada case. But, I mean, shouldn't the inquiry be confined to whether the facts meet what's in the advanced directive? In other words, whether the person has said, you know, if I'm in a persistent vegetative state, I don't want these things, or I want these things. Okay. The, the person has already made a decision. So shouldn't the inquiry just be, is does the person's condition and the treatment and or the treatment or non-treatment that the person has, has selected meet what's in the advanced directive. I mean, why, why is there another inquiry? In Ontario? Well, in Ontario, that would be the end of it. So if you had a, a, an advanced directive that was valid in Ontario that said, I want this in these circumstances, and we've determined that those are the circumstances that you're now in, you're going to get it, okay? The surrogate really isn't even allowed to contravene your advanced directive, so that you're guaranteed. In tech, I'm sorry. Why shouldn't that be the case here? Why should well, the Texas person be permitted to, to make that choice? And the inquiry is over whether the facts meet what's in the advanced directive. That's that's a policy question. So Texas decided that some people may complete an advanced directive, and we know that's what you really, really, really want. So, because you have the advanced directive, maybe there's backed up by a video documenting your decision-making deliberation process when you completed the advanced directive. So we don't doubt that it's what you want and it represents your true, authentic, deliberated preferences. But the legislature of Texas decided some people are just gonna make decisions that we don't think should be honored. Other states like Idaho, Oklahoma, New York decided, no, if we know that's what you want, the doctors have to provide it. And we don't care if the doctors think it's a stupid decision. We don't care if the doctors think it's cruel. You gotta follow the surrogate. I mean, there could be an issue about whether the person meets the stand, whether they're in a persistent vegetative state or not, but that should be the Oh yeah, no, you're still gonna have evidentiary problems about whether or not these are really those circumstances, and you're gonna have evidentiary problems about did they really understand what they were doing when they completed the advanced directive? How much thought, how much informed consent went into the completion of the advanced directive? But, 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 uh, but there's a, that's, a, that's a policy question that's been answered in completely opposite ways by different jurisdictions. Marcia. So, um, do, do the various, who is it who decides the definition of futility? In a, you know, in any given case, who's deciding actual futility? Is that part of what's in the statute? So the term, so they don't use the word futility in the statute, they use the word inappropriate. Um, it's, so there aren't any standards built into the statute, so it's highly variable, because who's making the decision is, in, in the first instance, it's, it's, the, it's the attending physician, and then in the second instance, it's, that, it's the review committee at that attending physician's facility. And how that attending and that committee determine it is going, in, in fact, I can guarantee you this, is, is very different from how even at the very same facility, if you had a different attending, um, is going to do it. And it's definitely different from the way uh, different facilities across, across the street, across the town, or across the state are making it. So it's, it's a lot of variability, which is a little disturbing. And so there's no, okay. Can I ask you just one other quick question? What, what about um, unrefriended patients? Is there, is there a different... Do they direct, go directly to these committees, or is there a surrogate? Um, so what, do people know what unbefriended? These are, there's patients who have no available surrogate. So everything I've talked about assumes that, the, that there's somebody who's shown up to speak on behalf of the patient, usually a family member, but some people have no available family member or friend to speak on their behalf. In general, those cases are actually easier because there's no conflict. It's just a question about I, 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 unfortunately, the, the default rule in most jurisdictions in the United States is the attending will just do what she thinks is right. Okay, so no, There's no, no review. Found to possibly create a conflict. I guess that's my 
there's right. nobody who doesn't have There's it. nobody to oppose. The attending thinks it's the right thing to do, she'll just do it. In New York, it's a little bit, they actually have, in the VA system, have some nice models that provide more oversight for that. But outside New York in the VA system, it's, it's the Wild West in terms of how decisions are made for unbefriended right. patients. So in New York, there's a surrogate decision-making test? Is, is that what you're talking about? No, that's for mental health. Okay. I'm talking about, the, in the statute, in the 2010 Family Health Care Decisions Act, there's a hierarchy. In other words, as, as the decision has more serious consequences, I think they break it up into minor medical, major medical, and then life-sustaining treatment, more oversight is triggered that correlates to the seriousness of the decision at hand. Oh, yeah. Um, it strikes me, and, and maybe I'm wrong, but aren't most of, or are, how, would you, how would you say the majority of cases occur? I mean, my sense is it isn't so much where there is an advanced directive, but where there is no clear advanced directive on the part of the patient, and then the family just makes a decision. Well, yeah, absolutely. Sure. Oh, yeah. I mean, and we know that because we know that in general, advanced care completion rates are pretty mediocre. So most people don't have advanced directives. And we also know that 70% of the people who have advanced directives, I'm sorry, 70% of the people who completed advanced directives don't know where they are. Um, you, you, you know, in other words, they're not, or at least let's say it another way, they're not available to the clinicians that actually need them. Because you're admitted, and under the 1990 Patient Self-Determination Act, when you're admitted to a healthcare facility that receives Medicare, we have to ask you, do you have an advanced directive? People say all the time, yeah, I do. Where is it? Don't know. Okay, so in other words, so the, the effect... It okay, well, good. No, <laughs> right, I mean, we're working on it, but... Um, so, so absolutely, most of the time we have no first-person evidence from the patient herself about what she would have wanted, and so... It's just the surrogates representing um, what they think ought to be done for their loved one. So yes, you're right. Kathleen and Larry. Um, I'm wondering if the reverse situation where it's a go instead of a stop, and the hospital or the review board makes that decision of the surrogate, how are the costs? Uh, I'm sorry, the, say it again. The this, cost of the... Well, no, I'm sorry, back, I want to make sure I got the first part. Oh, okay, assuming that it's a go, that you're going to continue life treatment. Because the committee agrees with the surrogate. Yes. Okay. Then who or, or disagrees with the surrogate? So if you have a family member that feels that end of life should occur, the review board says no. Okay. And you go ahead and that person is in ICU for another year or two years. Who assumes those costs if that person hasn't made that decision. I mean, it's the hospital making the decision. And, and that does occur where there is a, um, where they have sustained life. Okay, let me see. So the, the, the physician has, thinks that continued treatment is inappropriate, brings it to the review committee, but the review committee says, sorry, doctor, we, we, don't, we think this is actually appropriate. Um, who pays? Well, I mean, Medicare is paying for most of this. I, I thought you were asking the other situation, because this actually happens sometimes, which is the review committee determines that life-sustaining treatment is medically inappropriate, but for some reason then continues anyway and continues to bill Medicare. I, and I've been waiting for the U.S. attorney out there who's going to say, you, have, you went through this whole process and you determined that this care is medically inappropriate and outside the standard of care, and now you're going to bill us for it? Um, I don't think so. You know, I mean, it's fraud. Um, and, but, but I'll actually confess, I'm not super clear, and it's kind of hard to come by um, how the payment side of this works. Uh, well, at least when I, w I was involved, I, I used to teach um, nursing in a while ago, so I'm, I'm not sure what's current. But there were many times when a decision would be made to prolong life, and they're in ICU, and the family can't afford it. There's a collection action afterwards. Their home is compromised. Their assets are compromised. And I'm just saying, when a hospital makes that decision, that well, that actually that's another. Ch so actually, I should back up. When I was representing that, the the consensus rate is really really high, and we hardly have any intractable disputes. Some people like to point out to me. Well, yeah, but some of that high consensus rate is actually the result of bullying. 
And one of the ways in which surrogates are bullied into consenting is they say, yeah, we'll do it, but we're, you know, but this is how much it's going to cost. You know, it's 1500 a day in the ICU. You know, so, and then they say, oh, um, well, that maybe, maybe grandma doesn't really need that. So, so, that, so that they do sort of, um, it, it's, but some people think actually appropriately we should share. This is how much it costs. This is how many healthcare resources you're consuming, you know, just to, so they can make a more informed decision. And so that, that. Because there are people on chemotherapy that decide not to continue just for the sheer cost of it. And they decide that they do want to end their life uh, without it. And, but if the hospital makes that decision or the review board, then, then Oh, you're talking about a situation where they wanted to uh, hasten their death, but the hospital wouldn't allow it. Oh, yeah, that's, that's, um, unfortunate. So, yeah, there's, so I wrote a separate article on that where, um, well, actually, I'll take a more egregious case. This is, these are just bat plain up batteries, okay? It's, it, they're, they're absolutely batteries. Life-sustaining treatment was provided without consent and over the objections of the surrogate, which I guess is what you're, what you're talking about. There's been a bunch of litigated cases on that because then the hospital got sued for battery or intentional affliction of emotional distress. And, and part of the, dam the claim damages are, I had to pay for the, you know, the next 12 to 18 months. You have to pay me back because I, I didn't authorize that. That was your decision, so you pay for it. Most of those cases they lost and they couldn't recover from the healthcare facility for the costs that their decision uh, pushed onto the family. It not, not, I don't agree with those, I'm just saying that's, that's the outcomes. Larry and Rob, then we'll go for Get, get you two. Thank, thank you for the presentation. Uh, the question I have is framed in that there's a hierarchy of life-saving measures. You mentioned dialysis. Uh, ventilation, tracheostomy, uh, each of them can be life-saving. And there's a uh, hierarchy of how severe is that intervention. But then there are other life-saving measures like IV therapy, uh, food, nourishment, hydration. Do ethics committees deal with the level of intervention with intravenous therapy, glucose, sugar, salt, and water as being still a life-saving measure because the patient will die ultimately not given that, uh, as opposed to very invasive dialysis, etc. How do ethics communities deal with that higher so, um, so they, I mean, there are, it does, there are cases that go down the continuum, right? So antibiotics, another example, right? So they, they do cover the complete panoply, but at least f from a lawyer's perspective, the cases that get litigated and, and, and at least, or at least go to a, a, some form of tribunal, almost always have the, the more technology-oriented uh, interventions on this end of the spectrum. So I haven't seen a lot of futility cases where the uh, proposed treatment plan was to stop this other this low technology stuff. But, but does it go to ethics committees? Sure. Rob? Yeah, thank you for your presentation, Professor Pope. I guess uh, I don't really see much of a difference between the, uh, I like the Ontario consent capacity board, but I don't see how it's different than our probate board addressing, you know, whether the hospitals here to get a conservator removed, to have somebody else, an independent person, appointed that's going to make a different decision. Uh, how would you answer that? Yeah, so I think the answer would be this, which is, in some states, just because of the way in which their probate court system operates, they basically have what, what the Consent and Capacity Board would offer. But I don't think that that's, that so-called surrogate replacement mechanism is equally efficient uh, in every jurisdiction. So, so that, I mean, that, I think that's, that's the... Uh, I don't know. I mean, I guess I don't know. I don't know if you, if you feel that there's a surrogate making an inappropriate... And it could be either direction, of course. It could be 
the person's totally going to recover and you want us to let them die, I mean, they're going to make a full, you know, or if they're too, if the surrogate's too aggressive, either way, if it's easy to go down and, and have, a, have the court appoint a new, uh, whether it's guardian or conservator or whatever the right title is, yeah, then, they, then, then you're absolutely right. I agree with that. You, you basically have that mechanism already. And the courts are required to hear these cases every, uh, every three days in Connecticut, so we seem to be pretty consistent with some of the stuff you propose. Yeah, so the only, other, the only other question that I would, I mean, there are some other questions I'd want to ask, which is, of all the other things that those judges do, I mean, are, are they trained? In, a, in other words, these are, that's just a criticism, actually, that's equally brought against the CCB. Because it started off, again, as a general mental health court, basically. These futility, end-of-life treatment cases is, tiny, tiny sliver of what it does. The boards, it's a, there's a giant panel, just like you have a roster of neutrals, right? It's a giant panel, um, but each, each board that would convene for a particular case is just three members, a lawyer, a psychiatrist, and a community member. And so some people say, well, if you're deciding critical care medical treatment cases, what is a psychiatrist, a lawyer, and a community member? Why don't you have a critical care physician on those panels? So there's a challenge that the CCB doesn't have the relevant uh, expertise or competence to adjudicate these cases. And then, but I would, then I would want to ask the same question as to these uh, parallel CCBs about the Connecticut probate judges as well. Whether or not the physicians involved in the decision making process. Yeah, I mean, are you, I mean, do they have, are they is there a um, independent expert uh, that's been appointed uh, to advise the judge here, o other than just hearing from the, f from the experts that are brought over by the hospital. Right. Um, right. So that, that's, I just want to make sure that... Th that it's usually only done if the, uh, someone from the family is in court, but they not Right. So all the medical expert evidence yeah. that's presented is, by, is, is from one side, right? So, that's, so, so I agree that the mechanism works, uh, but again, I would want to dig in and look at, at the fairness of that process. What a super... Um, idea for an article for somebody next year. <laughs> oh, probate journal students. Uh, you have a question? Uh, thank you. Um, so I'm a med student, so this is great. Interesting to see kind of how things may impact us uh, when we practice in the future. Um, pertaining to like what's going on in Texas, has, has this been, has, uh, does this pertain to pediatric patients as well? Um, if the attending feels the, that More than a hundred um, times, and, and two two that are documented. So you could easily, you could get these on PubMed. Son Hudson and Emilio Gonzalez, two of the most high-profile cases to come out of Texas. Both um, those were both um, pediatric, and then also there's the NICU. There's the congenital abnormality. So there's there's pediatric cases. There's your NICU cases. Um, so the Texas Advanced Directives Act. Uh, it treats the whole spectrum of patients. Uh, to, so somebody was asking, where, what I said surrogate, another type of surrogate is a parent. Um, it applies to all types of decision makers making decisions on behalf of the patient. So it, it's equal. In fact, as you sort of suggested, it's hard when it's a kid. And it might very well be the case that these, these conflicts disproportionately are pediatric cases only because it's easy to let the 103-year-old go. It's harder to, um, to, let, to let the kid go. I was just going to say on the med student, for the med student, you know, if you look at the case, I mean, the states have historically had a greater role in the treatment of children. They've had greater say 
you know, the, the Jehovah's Witnesses, the blood transfusion. And we just had a case here in Connecticut, I remember, where the 17 year old who wanted, uh, didn't want chemotherapy, and, you know, the state went to court and, you know, forced her to take it. So, I mean, the state has had a greater say in the treatment of children than adults. Right. It, it, and actually, if you take the Cassandra, I mean, at one level, that's, it, this is really just the flip side of that, right? It's where you, that's where we think this is going to be highly effective, minimal side effects, and it's going to be highly effective. And so we're not going to honor your refusal here. And this is at the other end, where it's so incredibly likely to be ineffective with incredibly high side effects, where we're not going to honor your decision to... Reverse as well. I mean, you can have parents for whatever reason. You know, they're Christian scientists or something, and they say, we don't, we don't want it. <laughs> But that, but they're, yeah, but they're, they're all they can't yeah. act. Yeah, and the state. It, it's always best with your standard. You can't act consistent with yeah. the patient because that's your religion, not necessarily the kid's right. religion. So we're not. It's, you don't get a complete uh, opt out for that. For any of the states that are considering having ethics committees make these decisions, um, I don't know who would promulgate them. But is anybody? Yeah, no, I think that's a, that's a really scary thing. So there's a trend outside the, so I'm just talking about fut medical futility conflicts. In general, there's an expansion of, across the country, of giving more power. Let me back it up. Ethics committees really came into being in 1992 when it was built into the Joint Commission uh, standards. In general, they've been advisory, right? They just say, hey, doc, this is what we think. They give advice and consultation. More recently, though, there's been a big trend to giving ethics committees power, decision-making power, and including in New York, right? And what's scary is that they're getting more and more power, but nobody hardly has ever answered how big is an ethics committee, Who's on it? What's their background? What's their qualifications? How does it operate? How does it reach these decisions? So they're just kind of giving them power, and there's no definition as to the composition or qualifications of the membership. Um, it's kind of is, is scary. It you know it's, I mean? it's, it's just giving the power with no accountability in return. Um, no, nobody, there's not, well, the VAs work. I think if anybody's doing it, the, the pioneer, because it's the biggest system, they have 150 ethics committees. If anybody is pioneering on the, uh, you could pull their, it's all public, of course, because it's federal government. They define more than anybody else the composition and operation of their, of their ethics committees. So I think the idea, I think their idea is we'll innovate, we'll prove it works, and then, and then after we do it, then some other, then Kaiser will follow us, and then the, the rest of the systems will domino downwards. Thank you. <clears throat> and, and we'll particularly, Richard, then, yeah. Actually, well, let's, let's talk in the back of the room and come this way. So. Yeah, so just to follow up with that, there's no state regulatory boards or anyone evaluating the decisions that the ethical committees are, are, <clears throat> ethics committees are making and looking back at the data or anything like that. The decisions are made, and according to the Texas Act, there's no judicial review, so decisions made, and then that's it. Well, so it's not zero. So somebody was asking about the constitutional challenge. So again, you don't, there's no judicial review allowed under the statute itself, okay? But again, at least for the med students maybe, hierarchically, it's just a state statute, right? So you can always come in and say, it's inconsistent with the Texas Constitution, it's inconsistent with the federal statute, you know, MTALA, the ADA, um, or it's inconsistent with the U.S. Constitution. So you, you don't have no rights to challenge the ethics committee decision under Texas law, but your claim would be I have the right to challenge it under this higher law and the whole the statute to the extent it denies that review is, 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 is uh, illegal because it's trumped by the supremacy clause. So, but there hasn't been a lot of litigation. Um, or, the, or there has, but it all fizzles out. So we have no court. Uh, there was one published court decision went up on appeal and basically People were trying to introduce, the family's trying to introduce standard of care evidence, and the, the court said, this is all irrelevant because we don't, you're trying to challenge the merits of the ethics committee decision. 
and that's out, we're not allowed to look at that. So that evidence is irrelevant. The only thing that, tech, that the Texas courts are really literally given, uh, and this is what this court said, the right to do, is if you find a transfer facility, long-term care facility, another hospital, but it's going to take you a little bit more time to iron out the ambulance, then you can go and say, I found a facility. I just need five more days to effect the transfer. You can get an extension. And that's only if you show a preponderance of the evidence that it's really going to work, that the transfer is really going to happen. But that's it. So, um, and, and in other, other places, yeah, um, no, not much. Uh, well, let me say, just say one thing. In general, courts are willing to defer. There have been courts times where somebody came in to challenge what the Ethics Committee had done. In California, there's a number of cases. And in general, if the, the court is smart enough these, in these cases, if the Ethics Committee is fairly comprised, has external members, not affiliated with the hospital, and shows the process that it went through to reach its decision, then the court is often willing to defer to say, well, you know, they, they had this long and exhaustive, careful and fair process. Good. You know, it, it kind of relieves the burden of the judge having to make this decision, and they're willing to just go with it. Um, and then when the decision is sloppy, they don't follow the Ethics Committee decision. So th they actually peek inside and look at the composition and process of the Ethics Committee before they decide whether or not they're going to reverse or follow it. Jeffrey, <clears throat> noteworthy about the lobbying from Texas Tech. Noteworthy about the lobbying? It's it's fascinating. I mean, it's it's absolutely it's so every year since 2003, Texas legislature is a biennial legislature. So it's three, five, seven, nine, eleven, thirteen, and now we're in fifteen. Big fight, right? Um, and the, the fight is... There's some buyer's remorse after me. But that's that, what? That was one of the ironies in, the, in your article, is that while this is a model for other states, that the Texas legislature, at least many of them, are having kind of buyer's remorse. And they're trying to change it because uh, they don't think it's the best. Well, there's two, yeah, and there's two types of changes happening. And maybe I need to clean this part up. There's, there's changes where people really think it could be more fair. 48 hours notice, that's probably a little too short. You're not going to be able to get the medical records and show up at that meeting with an, you know, with an independent medical expert. So, there, so there's one type of change where they're just trying to change the notice periods, make it more fair. Then there's another type of change, which is they just want to kill it. Texas right to life, this is, this is evil, right? If somebody said, if, if, the sur if that's what the surrogate wants, you got to give it to them. Who are you to question their values and their, what they believe is a meaningful life? So there's those two types of changes every year for some reason. The Texas Medical Association, of all the things they need to defend, you know, scope of practice issues and everything else, this is up there at the very top of their, you know, this is what they're spending their dues, their physician dues dollars on, is defending this law. Um, so it's, it's a pretty interesting little battle every other year in Texas. Uh, Don? The thing about the Texas Medical Association, the Ontario panel process, it seems that that, only, that they only really address a small subset of what the, the, where the decision may be, uh, may be in conflict. And so that, that in many of these cases, as we just talked about before, that where there is no advanced directive and really the only evidence of what the individual might have chosen would be what the family says, you know, where, how are they going to be able to contradict that? And it seems like those situations aren't even going to be addressed by the situation in Ontario. No, I think uh, if this is where you're going, that's the typical situation, right? We usually don't really have these, you know, we're trying, we always see these, there's a big push to do more advanced care planning and have conversations with your family members. But most people don't really know what their loved ones would want in these situations. So, so the, that's the typical situation is we don't really know one way or the other what mom or your wife or whoever would have wanted. In that circumstance, in Ontario, as in any state in the United States, you then revert to a pure objective best interest standard. And frankly, when you're on that standard, the physicians usually win because they're able to say, this is going to cause suffering. 
but and, and it's uncompensated by any medical benefit. They're not going to recover. They're not going to get back. They're not going to be ever discharged out of this ICU. So it's all burden, no benefit, right? And they could just present that case, and the court, at least the consent and capacity board, will say, okay. Um, so that, so I think actually. It, for, on the clinician side, when, you, when you're on a pure, when we don't know anything about the patient preferences, that actually favors the clinicians. Because I think then they could tell their story about why they think this is the right thing to do. And, and that sort of led into a broader issue, is that we're talking about procedure, we're talking about these mechanisms. What is happening, or is there anything happening to have um, a bigger conversation about uh, values, meaning of life, what it is, what we are, that when we're expending enormous amounts of money at end of life, that, that those resources are depriving other people of real opportunities for, uh, for uh, you know, quality, real quality of life. Right. And so, and, and where, I mean, I don't get the sense that those conversations are taking place place because people are scared of it or uncomfortable about it or whatever, but I mean, those seem to be the conversations we should be having, uh, and, and are they, you know, where does that happen? Yeah, although, I, I mean, people try to, most of this debate has happened, I mean, somebody asked about insurance, most of this debate has happened without talking about resources. It's really just about what are the appropriate ends and objectives of medicine. Um, you know, and it's no, people normally have not made the research. And I think they don't want to be tainted with that. I say, oh, you just want to save money. Or you don't want to, you, you know, because they're afraid of the death panels and they say you just want to knock all these people off to make, clear up a bed and get a new source of reimbursement for that bed. So, I, so people generally, I think, either have deliberately stayed away from the resources issue. Also, I mean, even though I'm talking about this, how many fertility cases are there in the entire United States and how much is it really costing? There's a little debate there. UCLA in their study tried to quantify it. Um, and so and they actually came with a dollar figure, but the pretty powerful rebuttal from some other critical care ethicists, clinicians, uh, physicians said that's all you know, garbage, the way you computed that. So it's not quite clear exactly, is this even costing us anything? How much is it costing us? So the, 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 so the justice argument, not quite clear what that looks like. But I totally agree it needs to be explored more because this debate has been framed in terms of autonomy versus beneficence and the justice or allocation of resources issues, distributive uh, justice issues, haven't been as flushed out. So I think that is kind of where this whole debate, and it's been happening since 1988, where this debate needs to go. It just hasn't really happened much yet. I mean, my sense is actually that it's more that, uh, that people are pushed into uh, extensive um, and, and heroic measures when they're kind of uh, in, in, when and that there's no real discussion about the futility of that, and the people just sort of go along, and the people, you know, have these astronomical. I, I agree 200 percent with that. So I'm talking about th when I talk about these futility conflicts, these disputes that we're trying to resolve. Like I started, I said these are surrogate-driven problems. It's because the clinicians think it's time to stop, but the clinic, the surrogates want to keep going. This pales, pales, pales in comparison to the problem of clinician-driven overtreatment. And if you read Atogawande's book, if you saw the front line a couple weeks ago, overwhelmingly, you know, it's the oncologists. It's, I mean, they are, they're foisting, without sufficient informed consent, aggressive treatment that if the family, if the patient themselves really knew how dismal the prospects were and how high the side effects were, they never would have consented to it. So absolutely, that's the far bigger problem in terms of waste of resources. Not, it's not the surrogates. Well, it's about Huh? Well, if you have the if you have the ninety thousand dollars, but um, uh, that it costs. But uh, no, absolutely. That but anyway, this this that's a far bigger problem. So um, we're at our, our one thirty mark. Uh, I do want to respect people who uh, uh, need to go. Um, uh, I know that our speaker is available. Uh, uh, his next uh, appointment is not till three. Uh, <laughs> Uh, and, uh, uh, in which he's actually being interviewed by the American, uh, the ABA Journal is, a, is interviewing our speaker today. So uh, uh, 
Um, but so, but again, feel free to, to stick around. I'm sure I'll ask some more questions. I do want to just to give people permission if they have to go, uh, like our friend uh, Kevin Giordano, who came all the way down from Springfield, right? I did, yes, indeed. So uh, thank you very much uh, for making the trip. Uh, Anybody has to go anyway, let's give him a hand.